What is up guys, Randomodium here, and today we're going to be talking about Juggernauts. This video is a follow-up of my How to Find Your Ideal Playstyle class and subclass video, so if you haven't watched that one yet, I highly recommend it. In this video, we're going to be covering Darius, Alawi, Mordekaiser, and Urgot. All other Juggernauts will be covered in other videos in the future. Also, I want to give a very special thank you to all of the Juggernaut mains who helped me with this video. As you can see on the screen, I had a lot of help. All of the in-game footage you see in this video was provided to me by other YouTubers and streamers, so please check them out. I've left a link to all of their channels and streams in the video description below. Juggernauts are some of the most feared champions in League. They have very high base stats, they do massive amounts of damage, and they're extremely tanky. They excel in 1v1 fights and can even 1v2, 1v3, or even 1v5 if played correctly. Most Juggernauts have a ton of sustain built into their kits, which allows them to survive in what seems like impossible situations. However, Juggernauts have much less mobility and crowd control than most other classes and virtually no utility. There are some Juggernauts with potent movement speed boosts and very strong forms of crowd control, but in general Juggernauts are extremely vulnerable to kiting. They struggle against team comps with long ranges and crowd control because they can never close the distance against them. There are two types of juggernauts, raid bosses and freight trains. Raid bosses are very immobile juggernauts who can kill pretty much anything that comes within reach of them. They are extremely tanky and they can deal absurd amounts of damage, allowing them to take on multiple enemies with ease. However, they are extremely vulnerable to ranged champions which can kite them. Freight trains are more mobile juggernauts who have movement speed boosts which allow them to rapidly close distance on their enemies, and they often have ways to stick to their enemies while barraging them with attacks, spammable abilities, or damage over time abilities. To compensate for this increased mobility, freight trains are either less tanky than raid bosses or do less damage than raid bosses on average. Special thanks to Dragon Shay for doing a great job defining Juggernauts. I've linked his post in the video description below. Raid bosses are shown on top and freight trains are shown on the bottom. Within each type of Juggernaut, there are those who are more ability based and those who are more attack based. Ability based champions are shown on the left and attack based champions are shown on the right. Today we'll be focusing on the champions in the upper left corner, the raid bosses who rely on their abilities. These are the true titans of League, able to take on entire enemy teams by themselves if they use their abilities correctly. However, these juggernauts are also some of the most immobile champions in the game, with very limited forms of crowd control. These juggernauts are Darius, Alawi, Mordekaiser, and Urgot. Alawi, Darius, and Urgot are all most commonly played in top lane. Mordekaiser is also played in top lane, but he is also occasionally played in bot lane and in mid lane. They will regret opposing me. Darius, the Hand of Noxus. Darius was reworked in patch 5.16, and he's been terrorizing the rift since then. His ban rate rarely drops below 10% since his rework and has risen as high as 90% at times. In solo queue, he averages more pentakills than pretty much any other melee champion in the game. Darius is also the only champion to get two pentakills at a world championship, both in 2015. The dragon bot lane was still pushed out, C9 controlled mid. Both sideways pushing for C9 too, they have that turret behind them for safety, now they're sieging mid, so they're using triple pressure on all the lanes. Oh, Might be see careful, an here's the jump in, it's a two-man ult, he catches balls, Sneaky is out, there's a turret alive, though they gotta be careful, a big knockback, and that's the kill into Morgana, Azir goes down as well, but the dunks are coming through, a double kill for balls, a triple kill for that's balls, nice. holy cow, they're all gone, get back. a kill. kill for balls, holy cow, that's why he's been picking Darius, Cloud9 at three members alive. And what an aggressive use of flash ulti there for Incarnation. He knew he would drop in the fight, but he would generate so much damage for resets on both Sneaky and Balls. And they don't walk in with Mithy. Right now, Amazing would have an upgraded suit, but he's been dead. So this is in vision of Flash Wolf. They're can trying feel, to collapse. The they gotta finish coming. it. Amazing can jump over the wall. Who's gonna win this fight? It Amazing. goes to the red team. That goes to Origin. Here's the battle. Karsa alone in front, absorbing, gets dunked. So as is online, so he pulls down. He's still going. He doesn't get the third as Azonius comes across. He gets some damage on his stick. He He's on the NL. And it's going to save the game. So as gets a pentagon. 
that's how you win a game. A lot of what makes Darius so terrifying is his passive, Hemorrhage. Darius's basic attacks and damaging abilities cause his targets to bleed for significant damage, stacking up to five times. This bleed gives Darius a very scary dueling power at early levels and allows him to bully opponents out of lane or prevent them from even approaching the minion wave. This is mainly done by auto-attacking an enemy, activating his W crippling strike for an auto-attack reset, and then auto-attacking a second time while the enemy is slowed to get three very quick stacks of hemorrhage on the target. When combined with his E and his Q, this frequently allows Darius to get five stacks of hemorrhage on his target. Once Darius gets five stacks of hemorrhage on a target, he gains Noxian Might for five seconds. This buff grants Darius 30 to 230 bonus attack damage based on his level. At level 1, that's over 1,000 gold of extra stats. And at level 18, that's over 8,000 gold of extra stats. Do you think you could beat your lane opponent if they got an extra 1,000 to 8,000 gold worth of stats? This is what makes Darius such a terror to fight. He already has one of the highest base ADs in the game, and then on top of that, his passive grants him an insane amount of combat stats that you can never hope to match. This makes Darius always a threat, even if you've denied him a ton of CS and he's down multiple kills. On top of this, if Darius goes into Noxian Might, then any opponent he hits with an attack or a damaging ability applies 5 hemorrhage stacks to them. This is what allows Darius to get so many pentakills. Anyone he hits while in Noxian Mites gets max stacks of his passive, allowing him to deal massive damage to the entire enemy team. To add to all of this, Darius's ultimate is a true damage execute, which deals double damage if the target has max hemorrhage stacks, and can also be cast a second time if he kills the target. Furthermore, at rank 3, Darius' ultimate cooldown is completely reset if he kills the target, allowing Darius to dunk every single person on the enemy team. This massive amount of free combat stats combined with the bleed damage of his passive and the true damage of his ultimate allows Darius to build extremely tanky and still deal tons of damage. Darius typically builds only one damage item, either Black Cleaver or Triforce. Both of these items have the Phage passive, which grants him much needed movement speed in combat. Black Cleaver is picked in most games, especially if the enemy team has tanks, while Triforce is a much more situational item that is only picked up if the enemy team has a completely squishy team. Darius builds mainly tank items because they synergize extremely well with his Q, Decimate, which heals him up to 36% of his missing health if he hits 3 or more enemy champions. This means that a full build Darius can heal up to 1000 health per Decimate, which only has a 5 second cooldown at max rank. And since Darius typically builds items which give him cooldown reduction, this can drop Decimate's cooldown as low as 3 seconds in the late game. This is what makes Darius so extremely hard to kill, and is what allows him to stay alive long enough for his passive to completely wreck enemy teams. Another thing that is commonly overlooked in Darius's kit is that his E, Apprehend, passively gives him armor penetration up to 25% at max rank. Combine this with a Black Cleaver, and Darius can negate almost half of a tank's armor, allowing him to shred through a tank just as easily as a squishy champion. The cooldown of Darius' E is also greatly reduced with each rank, which is why most high-ranked Darius' max E second after Q. The disadvantage of Darius is that he's slow and easily kiteable. This is why many Darius's run the Ghost Summoner spell, and why Phase Rush is Darius' most common keystone rune. The best way to fight Darius is to never let him get close to you. If Darius can't heal off of his Q, then he can pretty easily be brought down with Focus Fire before he can reach max hemorrhage stacks. 
If you're a melee champion and kiting is not a viable option for you, then your best bet is to stay as close to Darius as possible. Darius only heals off of his Q if he hits an enemy champion with the outer one-third of the ability. Think of Darius like a Dark Souls boss. Hug that ass. If you let Darius get max hemorrhage stacks, he will absolutely destroy you and the rest of your team. Darius is not just another tank that can be ignored in a team fight. Poke him to the best of your ability before a team fight and use DPS carries like marksmen or battle mages to kill him before he enters Super Saiyan mode. If I hate something, I destroy it. If I want something, I take it. Ilawi, the Kraken Priestess. I'm not gonna lie, out of the four juggernauts that we're gonna talk about today, Ilawi has to be my favorite. Her ability to keep constant pressure on her opponent with her longer ranged harass and her ability to shut down most ganks makes her an extremely intoxicating champion to play. She is an ultimate power fantasy, wielding the power of a god in her hands to destroy anyone who stands in her way. Ilawi is all about hitting her E, Test of Spirit. It is so crucial to her kit that most Alawi players max it first, even though it doesn't do any damage on its own. If Alawi lands her Test of Spirit on a champion, she pulls the champion's spirit out of their body for 10 seconds. The spirit is immobile, and a percentage of all damage dealt to the spirit is transferred back to the enemy champion. If the spirit is killed or the target moves too far away, then they become a vessel which causes them to spawn tentacles and causes all tentacles to automatically attack them. Alawi will typically stand very close to the tentacles created by her passive, Prophet of the Elder God. When her lane opponent moves forward to last hit minions, Alawi will barrage them with her Q, Tentacle Smash, and attempt to hit them with her E. If she lands her E, then Alawi's tentacles will automatically attack the spirit, and then she can use her W, Harsh Lesson, on the spirit to cause her tentacles to attack the spirit a second time. This causes a significant amount of damage to the target and heals Alawi as well, since each time one of her tentacles hits a champion or a spirit, she heals for 5% of her missing health. This play pattern is extremely oppressive and can whittle down enemies very quickly while Alawi remains at max health. This typically results in the enemy top laner calling for jungle assistance, but this also plays right into Alawi's hands. Once Alawi unlocks her ultimate, Leap of Faith, she becomes able to easily 1v2 champions who try to challenge her when she's near her tentacles. When Alawi uses her ultimate, she summons an additional tentacle for each champion or spirit near her. This means that Alawi can have 3-5 to five tentacles active during a normal gank, each of which heals her for 5% of her missing health each time they hit an enemy champion. Furthermore, while her ultimate is active, the cooldown of her W Harsh Lesson is reduced as low as 1.1 seconds, means that she can attack with all of her tentacles as often as once every 1.1 seconds. This makes it extremely difficult to gank an Alawi when she has her ultimate up, especially if she lands her E on you beforehand. Alawi synergizes very well with Kleptomancy as her keystone rune. She can prop Kleptomancy on spirits as well as champions, and her W, which is on a 4 second cooldown, allows her to prop Kleptomancy early and often. This allows Alawi to gain a healthy gold advantage and also gives her a ton of consumables to better sustain in lane. I personally like taking Resolve secondary for Demolish so I can take towers quicker, but many other people feel that Ravenous Hunter from the Domination Tree is essential on Alawi. As far as items are concerned, Black Cleaver is a must buy on Alawi, and Stare Gauge is also extremely common. Alawi synergizes very well with Spirit Visage, and it's a must-buy if the team has two or more AP threats. Besides that, Alawi generally builds Tanky to counter the most fed carries on the enemy team, though occasionally you'll see Alawis go for more offensive items like Death Stance or Guardian Angel. While Alawi is extremely strong in her lane where she has established tentacles, she's not very good at roaming, TP plays, or team fighting. 
Most of Alawi's strength comes from her tentacles, and it takes time for her tentacles to be established. If you're against an Alawi and you're struggling against her, just don't fight her. Just push out your wave as fast as you can and try to rotate to other lanes to assist other teammates. Alawi cannot rotate as fast as other top laners, and she is less effective rotating since she won't have any tentacles in the new location. If you have an Alawi on your team, do not expect her to group. She is much stronger split pushing. If an Alawi does group for a major objective like Baron or Drake, it's usually best to stall around the objective so she has time to set up her tentacles. Do not immediately engage into a team fight unless you have a clear numbers advantage. Alawi is extremely strong when her tentacles are near, but very weak without her tentacles. Like other raid boss juggernauts, Alawi is extremely immobile. She is very vulnerable to kiting, and her only form of crowd control is her E. While Alawi's ultimate is extremely powerful, it is static in location, and it only lasts for 8 seconds. Typically when Alawi uses her ultimate, it's best to just disengage and wait for it to run out. Alawi is also extremely reliant on being able to get healing from her tentacles. If you hard crowd control an Alawi, she can be bursted down before she gets any of her tentacle attacks off. Alawi is also very vulnerable to grievous wounds from Morello Namakon, Bramble Vest, or Executioner's Calling since it significantly reduces her healing. All in all, Alawi is an extremely strong champion if she's on her home turf. She's near impossible to 1v1 near her tentacles, and she's also extremely strong in 1v2 or even 1v3 scenarios. However, if she doesn't have time to prep her tentacles, she loses a lot of her power and she becomes mortal again. I like my weapons how I like my music. Heavy and metal. Mordekaiser, the Iron Revenant. I remember playing back in Season 1, when League was still a relatively unknown game. Latency was a major issue, and there were only a few servers people could play on, namely NA, EU, EUNE, Southeast Asia, and Korea. Back in those dark days, you'd occasionally get players from Brazil playing on the NA server with 300 plus ping, and inevitably those games would be decided by which team had less Brazilian players because those guys were freaking awful. I'm talking 15 CS and 0 10 0 at the 10 minute mark awful. Remember that this was at a time before pings existed in the game, so not only were they playing on 300 plus ping, but they had no way to communicate with the rest of the team because they all spoke Portuguese. Mordekaiser was one of the most popular picks among these Brazilian players at that time because he was one of the few champions you could play with 300 ping and still occasionally get kills on. This is how one of League's original memes was born. Mord es numero uno. Hu, hu, hu. This meme was pretty bad uh, since Mord es numero uno is Spanish and Brazilians speak Portuguese, but whatever. The spirit of the meme was true, even if they got the translation wrong. To this day, I still cross my fingers and hope that whenever Brazil plays in an international tournament, one of them will have the balls to lock in Mordekaiser, just for the memes. Since those early days, Mord has been reworked into the juggernaut of heavy metal and bonking. Not only is Mord the lead guitarist for the band Pentakill, he was also one of the most feared champions at the 2015 World Championship, where he was banned in 68 out of 73 games. In the five games he wasn't banned, he was picked in four of them and he had a 100% win rate, making him definitely numero uno that year. While Mord saw a huge success at the World Championship, the Mordekaiser rework of 2015 was met with a special breed of hatred from the League community because Riot tried to rework Mordekaiser into a bot lane juggernaut in an attempt to artificially shake up the meta. Unfortunately, the only way to make a melee champion viable in bot lane is to make them way, way too powerful. They also had to find ways to gut mid and top lane Mordekaiser while not affecting bot lane Mord, which wound up pissing off all the Mordekaiser mains who wanted to play him in mid lane and top lane where he was conventionally played. After numerous nerfs and changes to his kit, 
Mordekaiser has returned to being a niche pick with a very devoted group of people who one-trick him, but who isn't played much outside of that community. Mord traditionally sits at right around a 50% win rate with less than 1% play rate and less than 1% ban rate. He is considered to be underpowered by many, but people don't play him because he's overpowered. They play him because they love his thematic elements, his style, and the fact that every one of his abilities are references to metal songs. Mordekaiser is an extremely strong 1v1 duelist, but he's one of the most immobile champions in the game. There are very few melee champions who can match Mordekaiser in a fight, but he's very vulnerable in ranged matchups, and he's also very vulnerable to being ganked. A lot of Mordekaiser's power comes from the fact that he is mana-less, and his passive Iron Man converts 25% of the damage he deals into a shield. However, each of Mordekaiser's abilities cost him health. This is why Mordekaiser's W, Harvester of Sorrow, is most commonly maxed first. Mord's W deals a decent amount of damage, gives him a movement speed boost, and heals him for quite a bit for every champion or minion near him. This allows Mord to continually sustain and trade with his lane opponent, getting them closer and closer to the kill threshold with his ultimate. Mordekaiser's ultimate, Children of the Grave, is a point-and-click ability, which deals 25% to 35% of a target's maximum health over 10 seconds. This means that if Mord gets you to 25% health, he can activate his ultimate and be guaranteed to kill you, assuming that you don't kill him first. To make matters worse, if Mordekaiser kills you, then he enslaves your ghost to fight for him for up to 75 seconds. This allows Mordekaiser to get towers extremely quickly once he gets a kill, since he can use you to destroy your own tower. This is where Mordekaiser's true strength lies, rotations. If Mord gets a kill, he can knock down top tower extremely quickly, and then he can rotate to bot lane and either kill bot lane or force them off their tower. Once Mord's team takes bot tower, they can rotate to Drake. If Mordekaiser's team kills Drake, then guess what? Mordekaiser gets a freaking ghost dragon that he can use to push mid lane with. This ghost Drake is extremely powerful with several thousand hit points and has a ranged attack that can deal roughly 300 damage to a tower per attack. Mord can also use the ghost Drake to take out Rift Herald, allowing his team to get even more towers. As you can see, Mord is extremely powerful once he begins snowballing. However, if he falls behind, then he's not very useful because he's very slow, he's very vulnerable to crowd control, he has no crowd control of his own, and he usually doesn't build as tanky as other juggernauts. Mord does have AD scalings on his Q, Mace of Spades, and his E, Siphon of Destruction, but AD builds are not very common on Mord. Instead, most people build him with Rylai's and Leandries and then go for an off-tank build. One common beginner mistake that people make is they will try to go full damage items with Mord, and they'll end up dying before they can actually do any damage. Mord needs defensive items so he can survive long enough to close the distance on enemy champions. Summon Airy is the most common keystone on Mord, since he can proc it very rapidly since he's a melee champion. Most people also pick up Celerity and the Sorcery Tree for increased movement speed. For secondary trees, precision is the most common since coup de gras allows your ultimate to deal an extra 10% damage and triumph gives you good sustain after getting a kill so you can keep pushing to get towers. All in all, Mord is a very powerful champion on the right hand and he's pretty useless in the wrong hands. People either tend to love him or they hate him, but for those who love him, there is no substitute for the power that Mordekaiser brings to the rift. I am stronger than man, stronger than machine. I am an idea. Urgot, the Dreadnought. Urgot was the headsman of Noxus, an imposing figure who represented the essence of Noxus. Might makes right. Betrayed by Swain, he was cast in the depths of a Zonite mine, tasked to work as a slave until the mine killed him. Deep in the mines, Urgot learned that pain was power and that flesh was weakness. 
Replacing the parts of his body he deemed weakest, Urgot became more, a hulking monstrosity of machine and chemtech-infused weaponry, a dreadnought incarnate. And so Urgot rises, rises from the depths of the mines to take back what was stolen from him and to give all those who wronged him his gift, eternal agony. Urgot is now an agent of chaos and anarchy, putting all life on trial to earn the right to survive in his new world. In game, Urgot is an immense lane bully. Being the only ranged juggernaut in the game, Urgot is amazing at punishing enemies for every CS they try to get. It is not satisfactory to simply go even on Urgot. Urgot is about brutality and domination, stamping out the weak and sowing chaos in his wake. Urgot is about making his lane opponent's life hell to make them beg for a gank from their jungler. Expect to be ganked if you're playing Urgot. Accept it, embrace it, and turn it against your enemies. Waste the jungler's time. Punish your lane opponent mercilessly and back off just as the jungler tries to close the noose on you. Most of Urgot's laning power comes from his passive, echoing flames. Urgot has six legs, and contained within each of these legs is a shotgun that deals massive damage in an AoE. The legs, in addition to dealing damage that scales with Urgot's total AD, also deal up to 8% of the enemy champion's maximum health, making Urgot especially good at shredding through tank champions. Each leg has an independent cooldown, meaning that in an all-in situation, Urgot can fire off all six legs in rapid succession for a terrifying amount of damage. However, each of his legs only activate within a 60 degree arc, meaning that Urgot needs to move around his opponent in order to activate all six legs. This minigame is very similar to Fiora with her vitals, but it can be significantly harder to execute since Urgot is a much slower champion. One of the best ways for Urgot to proc his back legs is through his E, Disdain. This ability allows Urgot to dash forward a short distance. If he collides with an enemy champion, he flings them over his head and stuns them for 0.75 seconds. Another extremely important part of Urgot's E is that he can ignore crowd control if properly timed, allowing him to close the distance against ranged champions who think that they're safe. Urgot's bread and butter ability is his Q, Corrosive Charge, and the ability that you want to max first. This ability is a bit difficult to hit at first due to the delay, but is an essential skill that you need to learn in order to become effective with Urgot. In addition to doing decent damage, Urgot's Q has a very potent slow, which makes landing his E and his ultimate much easier. Urgot's W, Purge, is the ability that you want to max second, and is the ability that gives Urgot his tankiness. Unlike most Juggernauts, Urgot does not have any form of sustain. Urgot's tankiness comes from a shield granted by his W, which scales with 30% of his bonus health. When the purge is activated, Urgot automatically attacks the nearest enemy at 3.0 attack speed without interrupting his movement, though his damage and his movement speed are reduced. Additionally, the purge will prioritize enemies hit with any of Urgot's other abilities, making a great follow-up ability after you land your Q or your E. Urgot's W is the reason why you always want to start Cull on Urgot. Cull grants plus 3 health on hit, and Urgot's W gives him 3.0 attack speed, so with a Cull, you can heal 9 health per second while his W is on. Since his W lasts 4 seconds, this means that each time you use your W, you can heal up to 36 health. This is the only way for Urgot to sustain in lane, which is why a Cull is such an important buy for him. However, it's Urgot's ultimate, which is usually every person's favorite thing about Urgot. Urgot's ultimate, Fear Beyond Death, fires a drill out of his chest. If it hits an enemy champion, it slows them for 4 seconds. If within those 4 seconds, Urgot can drop the enemy champion below 25% of their maximum health, then the ultimate can be reactivated to pull his helpless victim back into the saw blades that make up Urgot's stomach and execute them. Nothing can save the victim of Urgot's ultimate except for Urgot's death. It gives the phrase, GET IN MY BELLY, a whole new meaning. All in all, Urgot's ultimate is one of the most viscerally satisfying abilities in the game. 
Not only do you delete the enemy champion off the map after devouring them, but as they're being pulled in, chains rip across their screen before everything goes gray. The first time it happened to me, I nearly jumped out of my chair and was like, what the fuck just happened? On top of all of that, Urgot's ultimate also creates an AoE fear around Urgot if it kills an enemy champion. This fear is extremely underrated and can allow Urgot to wreak havoc in team fights as his enemies flee in terror. For keystones, and more experienced players tend to grab press the attack on Urgot so he can rapidly stack it with his W. However, a few high level Urgots I talk to prefer Aftershock for the increased tankiness and survivability, especially for early 1v1s. I've also seen some high level Urgots taking Meteor in certain matchups for improved poke with their Q. In general, it seems like Meteor is better if you want to bully your lane or if your lane opponent has range, and Aftershock is better when your lane opponent has a lot of engage and you're worried about their all-in damage. Other very common runes for Urgot are Demolish, Conditioning, Triumph, and Last Stand. As far as items go, Black Cleaver and Righteous Glory are musts. After that, you want to build Urgot as tanky as possible since his W shield scales off of bonus health, though there are some instances where more offensive items like Maw of Malmordius and Frozen Mallet can be good on Urgot. Overall, Urgot is slow and clunky but extremely powerful. His playstyle is very oppressive, though he is susceptible to the same issues as other Juggernauts, mainly kiting and crowd control. If he's not careful, Urgot will auto-push lanes with his passive, which can open him up to ganks that he can't escape from. Furthermore, Urgot is a very unforgiving champion if you miss your abilities. However, if you learn his timings and his combos, Urgot can be an absolute terror on the battlefield, able to shred through tanks and squishy champions alike while feeling virtually invincible with his shield. And that's all the champions we're going to be covering it with this video. Let me know in the comments what you love or hate about these juggernauts and which champions or subclasses you want me to cover next. If you enjoyed this video, especially with the new in-game footage, please hit that like button. This video took a lot of work on my part and I also had a ton of help from juggernaut mains. As you can see on the screen, I had 30 juggernaut mains help me with this video. Quite a few of these people have YouTube channels or Twitch streams, and I've linked all of them in the video description below. Please check them out and show your support of me by supporting them as well. Also, if you're interested in any of these juggernauts, please check out the subreddits for each of these champions. There are a ton of helpful people who can answer all of your questions way better than I can. And if you made it this far in the video and you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of my videos. I hope you all have a fantastic day. This is Randomonium, signing off.